last three years, it was truly remarkable in terms of uh, uh, bringing together a, a number of people from our district and pathways and attempting to accomplish something that that medicine really has not done a good job with. And that is not just managing type 2 diabetes, but actually reversing type 2 diabetes. So when Garrett, uh, uh, he was down in our corporate main office, yeah, kind of double up me and said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm one of the founders. He said, oh, I want you to come speak to a group. Uh, and that's how I happened to be here. Um, and I thought he wanted me to come and talk about the medical aspect. He really wanted me to come and talk about the sports side of this. And actually, some of the leaders in helping us understand human adaptations of low carbon nutrition have been athletes. Uh, people who push the envelope, push the level of the body's ability to provide fuel for uh, high intensity activity. And so that's really been um, one of the drivers for our knowledge. And I'll share some of our research on that with you. Uh, so I'm going to try to give two one hour talks in one hour time frame. I've got 52 slides. I'm going to try to go through very quickly. I'll stay around. traveling overland with two Inuit families providing him with transportation and food. He had th uh, three other uh, European origin colleagues with him, uh, and he wrote about it in a diary and then published it that nobody ever read. And I stumbled on a copy in uh, 1980 when I was writing, writing my PhD dissertation. And the reason that's important is I discovered that he discovered something 100 years before me that I thought was important. And this quote here is, he says that when, he's, when you're thrown wholly upon the diet of the native, you're weak and you can't travel and you don't feel good. 
He says, but this passes away within two to three weeks. And this is the first reference I can find to what I named keto adaptation. That you can't just eat a low carb diet tonight and tomorrow have your body be fully adapt, adapted to, to using this diet. Uh, and he pointed out two to three weeks, and some of my athletes' friends now tell me it's more in the way of anywhere from two months to six months before they really get back to their peak performance capability as their bodies train from being a carbohydrate-dependent to a fat-dependent uh, status. Um, but again, Stefan's, or the, the Swatka didn't write down what they ate every day, so we had no idea of the macronutrient nutrient proportions that the Inuit consumed, but this guy, who is a, a, a tremendously um, committed iconoclast named Stefansson. Uh, he's uh, uh, born in, in uh, Alberta, Canada. He grew up in North Dakota. He went, did graduate work at Harvard, and then he went and lived for 10 years with the Inuit. And he wrote down a lot of stuff about his experience with the Inuit. Um, and came back, and in the early 1930, or 1920 to 1930, he, um, uh, in lectures and in books said, well, I could live on a diet of meat and fat with no vegetables and no fruit, and I didn't get sick. And people knew he was a liar because we discovered vitamin C, and we knew that vitamin C was absolutely required to, to prevent scurvy, a disease called scurvy. Um, and so he was called a liar, and to salvage his reputation, he allowed himself to be locked up in Bellevue Hospital in New York City, where he was under close observation, allowed to eat only meat and fat. And they knew that within three to four months, somebody who didn't eat uh, any source of vitamin C would develop scurvy. And after five months, he was still very healthy. And they said, we're getting bored seeing your ugly face every day. So I'm going to move to an apartment next to the hospital. And he came in two or three times a week to get checked. But he maintained his Inuit-based diet for a whole year and maintained completely normal health. Um, and the neat thing is that those scientists wrote down what, they, what he ate. And you can see the list here. Um, uh, and so. This is a guy who's five foot nine and weighed about, about 160 pounds, and he ate 115 grams of protein, over 200 grams of, of fat per day, and the only carbohydrate he got was the actual glycogen in the meat of the in muscles and organs of the animals that he was where he was getting his protein. Uh, and he ate a range of things, as, as uh, Professor Tim Noakes likes to say, he ate from nose to tail of the animals, which is what the people, you know, the Aboriginal people ate. Uh, the interesting thing is he didn't eat much lean meat. Almost everything he ate was fatty meat. And his point was that the Inuit, when they killed an animal, they saved the fat for themselves instead of the lean of their dogs, um, which is culturally just the opposite of what we do. Uh, <clears throat> and so given this information, I decided that I'd, I'd uh, look into what this did to, to people's performance. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry. The other thing I want to point out is the Inuit weren't the only ones, only Aboriginal culture that had a low carbohydrate diet. In their case, you could argue they could, they had no other choices. But for the Maasai who lived in the Great Rift Valley, uh, and we believe from based on archaeology that for over a thousand years they lived pretty purely as nomadic herders. So they herded sheep and cattle. Um, and uh, they did not live in permanent villages, they did not practice agriculture. Uh, they had very little trade with the Kikuyu people who lived in the, uh, along the lakes and the rivers uh, uh, where they were farmers. These people lived essentially on a diet of meat, milk, and, and I hate to say it, but blood. Um, and there's actually a good reason why they consumed blood. Uh, but I won't digress into that. Um, uh, but when two guys from the UK went to, this, to study them, uh, uh, I think Orr was the doctor and Giltz was the surgeon. So this was Dr. Orr and Mr. Giltz, uh, as you know, people in the UK like to call surgeons Mr. Um, they pointed out that the Maasai males were six inches tall and the females were three inches taller than the people living adjacent to them, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that they were eating a diet that appeared to be devoid of, of vegetable matter. So it appears that, that at least some human readers were adapt to do this. And again, it wasn't unique just to those groups, that uh, a painter named George Catlin uh, in the 1830s, uh, who had probably did, got tired of painting portraits of staid looking people in Philadelphia, so he took his brushes and his, his paint and his canvases west, and west of the Mississippi River chronicled the, the lives of, of uh, 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 Native Americans west of the Mississippi River. And 250 of those uh, paintings still survive in the Smithsonian. 
but he also wrote letters to, he, he left his wife in Philadelphia for 10 years and sent her letters and then it, he had very very uh, careful records of, of the lifestyle of these people and again for the nomadic peoples not the farming peoples uh, in the west of the Mississippi River uh, they ate very little carbohydrate you know gathered food season was only a couple months per year so somehow people seem to be able to adapt to a, a ketogenic diet seem to be able to grow and, and uh, reproduce um, uh, and so that really suggests that if there's something there worth studying. Um, I also want to point out that when people talk about low carb, typically they're, they're, on, they're talking about diets that are less than 30% of daily energy need coming from carbs. And so the, the paleo diet, which of course has a lot of definitions, uh, but Lauren Cordain, who is the primary academic who promotes has promoted the the paleo diet says that it's at least 20% carbs and typically about 30% protein, which means about 50% of the other calories come from fat. Uh, so it's higher in carbs and higher in protein than a ketogenic diet. And then to remain in nutritional ketosis, you have to get your carbs under 10%, not of daily, not of intake, but of energy expenditure. Remember, if you eat a lot less calories than you're burning, the macros on your plate are different than the macros you're burning. So I don't want to get too deep into that, but you can say, what are the macros? Well, we say get your carbs under 10% of daily energy expenditure. Typically, that's about 50 grams of carbs per day. Protein is in the 10 to 20%. Right up here to the 30% range, the higher the protein intake is going to suppress ketone production. So it's actually a fairly delicate balance of finding your personal level of carbohydrate and protein tolerance to get into that space and stay there. Uh, and I'll try to give you some reasons why that might be worth uh, and an effort for various conditions people may have. I must have Studies of comparing low carb and high carb diets 
you know, performance goes down 20 to 25 percent. But what was unusual, we did this study that lasted longer than one or two weeks. We did this study that lasted six weeks. So in six weeks, carrying the backpack, their performance was 30 to 40 percent higher than it was at baseline. So then that, and then we recovered back up. Uh, which it looked like it would Bob Atkins claim of a super energy dump. Except that their ponies became more efficient. They could actually work, do more work at less oxygen cost, which is that's right. Um, uh, so it really wasn't a fair test. And the other thing was that these athletes, these were not athletes, these were just you know, um, relatively sedentary, previously obese people who uh, went through this whole thing. Um, I assume you don't have oh, Okay. I'm just going to, and for this slide, mention ketones are, you know, people say, you know, if you're in ketosis and if you do the ketone test, if you're on a well formulated ketogenic diet, unless you've done a high, lot of high volume exercise in the last day or two, your ketones will be between 0.5 at the low end and up to maybe 3 up here. There's what we call post exercise ketosis, but if you do typically high volume but not high intensity exercise, it'll boost your ketones for a day or two afterwards. Uh, if you're in total starvation, total fasting for a week or more, your values will get up in the five to six range. Now, but almost no physicians are taught this information in medical school. What they're taught is that normal ketones are under 0 0.2, 0 0.1. That's where normal people are. And then if you have type two type or type one diabetes and you're going into ketoacidosis, which is a life-threatening condition with type one diabetes, you're above 10. So it's a hundredfold difference between what they call normal and then this here. And lost in the middle is this thing that we call nutritional ketosis, which is a range in which ketones are physiologically an available fuel for your brain, for your heart, for your muscles. And so when we talk about ketogenic diet, we're not talking about fasting, we're not talking about extreme high levels, we're talking about modest levels, say, that are one to three, but realize that one is 10 times greater than one. And that 10 is 10 times greater than 1. So we actually have long order differences between the cod fed state, the nutrition ketosis, and then uh, the dangerous state of ketoacidosis. So this was a study we did people walking on the treadmill. And this shows the decline at one week and then the resurgence at six weeks. But the oxygen cost of doing what seemed to be the same amount of work was less, which is a puzzler. So he said, we got to deal with people, A, who know what exhaustion is, and B, whose weight is in the change. So we have to worry about this weight change and carrying a backpack and all that stuff. So we recruited a group of being healthy guys who had time on their hands. This was back in the late 1970s. This is a group of licensed uh, amateur bike racers. And we had five subjects who agreed to go on basically the uh, Stefanson diet, which was 85% fat. 15% protein and virtually no carbohydrate for a month. So they did the baseline high carb diet for um, a one week and then a month on, on the, basically this macronutrient mix, holding their weight stable. So these guys were eating about 4,000, 4,500 calories a day, and 85% of the calories were fat. It completely freaked out the work, the dietitians and the research on it. They said, you know, it's going to kill people. And the first week or two, they felt like they were being you know, really held back. By the way, they maintained their 100 to 200 miles a week of training uh, when they did this. Uh, most of them didn't want to do it in Boulder, so they had no research for it. So they went out in the streets of, of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and out in Belmont, up in the hills. And somebody had to make sure they didn't stop from making these. So I got them a lot of bicycle riding. But for the first few weeks, that was cool. If I could just keep up with these guys, it was just great. And I could get past them. And after the third week of the ketogenic diet, I was back sucking their wheel because I, you know, they were fully back. And you know, I could tell they fully recovered their, their performance. So it was far superior to mine. And this is a lot of numbers. But what I want to point out is this top line up here, which is called VO2 max. This is the maximum rate at which the body is their body is able to use oxygen on a stationary vessel. So we just basically up the load, up the load, and up the load until they couldn't go any further. And and they were using five liters of oxygen, five point one liters of oxygen per minute at peak at baseline. And a month into the ketogenic diet, their VO2 max was still 5.0. That difference of 0.1 is not statistically significant. So they preserved peak aerobic power. 
Their terms time to exhaustion was uh, about two and a half hours uh, at baseline, and on average, three minutes longer. But that was average. There was no difference between the two groups. Two of the guys went a lot longer than Kitty Jared got, two of them went shorter, and one did exactly the same. And maybe that's because we all respond to these guys differently, particularly in terms of the duration of time as they become adapted. Um, and then I'll come back to this on a couple more slides, but um, this thing called RQ, or respiratory quotient, this is the ratio of CO2 production, that is, you may burn glucose or fat, you make carbon dioxide. And then O2 consumption is the rate in which your body's using oxygen here. So their, their respiratory quotient acted at this endurance pace, which is about 65% of the O2 max. When this value is 1.0, it means you're burning all carb. When it's 0 0.7, it means you're burning all fat. So what this says is they were burning about a 50-50 mix of carbohydrate and fat when they've been eating their, their balanced diet, which is about what their mix of fat and carb intake was. But after they had just four weeks of adaptation, they were down to find that they're burning almost all fat. At a, a very prodigious rate, this, this rate of energy expenditure um, to do this um, to do this this work of the, the endurance, this, this was exercising over 900 calories per hour. Uh, so you know this is not a, a light exercise thing we're doing, and we're doing it about 90 percent fat. Now we published this data in 1983, and it sat there uh, until just let's say let's, let's say it sat there until recently. Nobody believed it. Um, the, part of the reason nobody believed it is the world's experts in measuring um, fat oxidation in trained and untrained people in labs around the world had routinely looked at what, what human peak at fat oxidation is during exercise. And this is probably the biggest study that was done in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, the first author was a woman named Dr. Venables, but it was from a, uh, the lab of an echo of a highly respected researcher named Dr. Jukenblum. Um, and they studied 300 untrained and trained people and looked at their rates of fat oxidation. Um, and then they looked at them across varying levels of, 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 of um, training, physical training. So this measure of oxygen consumption, maximum oxygen consumption, in mils per milliliters of, per kilogram body weight per minute, typically the average untrained person will be around 40 mils per kilo per minute. Highly trained athletes get up, get up to up in the 60 range, and then superhumans are up here in the range around 80 mils per kilo. So these range from untrained people to highly trained people. And you can see the highest rate of fat oxidation was just under one gram per minute, or 60 grams per hour. Um, and you know, this is in 300 people looking at the whole spectrum of individuals. So the basic concept is humans can't, and even during exercise in a highly trained state, can't run fat any faster than one gram per minute, or 60 grams per hour. So, I mentioned this guy, Jeff Bullock, with whom I've done a lot of research and published a number of books, and he was joining my head. Well, he looked at my data and said, Steve, you need to look at this in a different way. Whoops. He said, let's take your data from your bike races and compare it to the Venables paper. So this was the highest they saw was 60 grams per hour or one gram per minute. The group mean was 28, and the lowest person was 11 grams per hour. And so Jeff took the lowest, the median, and the highest for my five bike racers. He said, every one of them is above one gram per minute. And the average is one and a half grams per minute. And so this is really our first point or point where we said, this is a completely different metabolic state for humans. That when you're keto adapted, your body becomes highly capable of burning fat for fuel. Um, and so, uh, Jeff said, we need to go back and, and look at this in a more concerted way. And I'll bring this maybe to a little bit, uh, a little bit of local lure here. Um, we were looking for people who were keto-adapted and, and uh, 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 like to do rigor, rigorous endurance exercise. So we came out and, and brought a team and actually did a study on the Western States Endurance Run back in June of 2012. Um, and studied over 20 uh, Western States runners, some of whom were 
but we're early adopters to the low carb uh, 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 approach and some of the high carb runners uh, and found uh, some interesting stuff, but we really didn't have the capability of putting them in the lab and doing really careful research. So we recruited a bunch of them to go back to the Jeff's lab and do a um, organized study. So we uh, recruited um, uh, 20 elite male ultra endurance runners, um, and these were all uh, uh, highly competitive runners, people who were placing very well on races. Um, They've been on, on either a high carb diet or a traditional high carb diet where they've adopted and followed the low carb diet for at least six months. And actually, the duration of the low carb diet was um, uh, on average two years. So these are people who are well through the adaptation process and have used this in multiple competitions. And again, a lot of numbers here. I'll just point out that these were very well matched groups in age. So they're in their early 30s. They're Weights were about 65 to 70 kilograms. Typical for the runners, they're under 10% body fat. And I'll point out that their VO2 maxes uh, in mils per kilo were about 65. So they were well matched and they're highly trained athletes. Uh, and the diets that they followed, the high carb runners ate up typical high carb intake, and the low carb runners were. Um, uh, uh, in the about 10% of their of the daily intake was reported at, as, as carb intake. So it's about 64 grams of carbs here and over 400 grams there. Uh, and again, this is not a high protein diet, it's a lot of protein diet. And the protocol that we used was we brought them in the lab in the morning, did a number of tests, including body composition analysis. Uh, we gave them a liquid shake for breakfast. Uh, we did something very mean. We took to what's called the um, Bergstrom needle, which looks like about a 20 penny building spike, uh, and took muscle biopsies from their thigh at baseline, and then after, then two hours into recovery, I'm not going to bore you with that data, but it's very provocative in terms of the body's ability to uh, conserve glycogen. So there's a store of carbohydrate, even when you're not eating carbohydrate. But the key of this key part of this was we put them on a treadmill and we had them run for three hours at race pace on a treadmill, which is basically a marathon for these guys on, on a treadmill. And looked at their fuel use um, during this. And when you look at fat oxidation, peak fat oxidation, the low carb runners, just like the Yukon group, Venables published study of their, their mean value was about 0.7 grams of fat per minute. And these are highly trained, um, very capable ultra endurance runners. And we take a group of people who look almost identical to them. The only way to tell them tell the differences by what they put on their plate. Over double the rate of fat oxidation. And there's no crossover. The highest person here was well below the lowest person here. And all but two of these, of these 10 runners, eight of them were just tight and grouped up there. Uh, which means that the human body, human body when given the proper conditions of adequate duration, is remarkably capable of shifting its metabolism and burning almost all fat to fuel. And so this is shown here across the three hours of the exercise. And these are the high carb runners. And they start off burning a little bit more carbs. And yes, they do adapt and reduce the carbs somewhat and burn a little bit more fat. But the low carb runners start to burn a little above 10%. And they're just constant. Right? And what the Low carb runners in ultra events like the Western States tell us most of them will use strategic carbs, or they call strategic carbs, in the event. But rather than eating 400 to 600 calories of carbs per hour, which is what the high carb runners have to do to make it over the mountains and over the bar to the finish line, these guys are burning or eating less than a quarter of that amount, typically maybe 100 grams of carbs per hour. And they figured this out in Europe, that's what they need to do. I feel this is what works. I don't get stomach upset. I feel fine. I maintain mental clarity. All the things that are problems that people have after they get past Forest Hill and you know the geography here, which is 60 miles that direction. Um, thank you. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 but when we look at the curve, not just of what their peak fat oxidation is, but where it occurs in every medical or every physiology textbook that you read, it'll tell you that oops, wrong spot, it's all here. That 
you increase fat up, fat oxidation to get up to about half of your peak power. And then once you get half peak power, you're increasingly dependent on carbohydrate to go higher. But the keto adaptive runners, they keep increasing fat oxidation up to 70%. And even at 80%, which is a high end of, of race pace for, for these ultra endurance athletes, they're running on a very high percentage of fat. So you take a skinny runner, start to squall valley, <laughs> and the guy has 8% body fat, he weighs 70 kilos. He's got 5 plus kilos of body fat. If that's technically about 7,000 calories per kilo, He's got 35,000 calories of body fat. It's going to take him or her 10 to 12,000 calories to get to the finish line. So that person has three to four times their fuel requirement in, in body stores. But if you're carb loaded, you only have 2,000 calories of carbs. And you've got 10,000 calories you're going to have to burn, which means you have to eat 6,000 of it to get to the finish line. So the difference is one's dependent on channel to be a chain of carbs and others. So again, it's, uh, it's a completely different fueling system, and we, the, the key point is you don't switch over. The other is some people don't seem to find that it works that well for them, and it may be we vary one from another. So again, we've not done a randomized trial where we switch people. We said, okay, now you go on this one for six months, and that's a hard thing to do. I will tell you, that three of the high carb runners in that, that study, the jet, three of the ten, did switch to low carb, and two of them reported to us that they not only scored personal best, but they actually won their local events that they've been struggling to do for five or ten years. Uh, so there were some people who, for whom it doesn't work, but there are some people who haven't tried to have it out of the And again, right now we don't have any litmus test. I don't think we have a device that we can have someone really into and say, you'll be a really good candidate for this type of thing. We still have to figure that out. Uh, but this is a picture of a guy named Tim Olson who was a very good low carb runner. Uh, I'm sorry, hard carb runner, he placed 18th at the Western States in 2011, and then he switched to low carb, and he came back in 2012. And this is three miles from the finish line called the No Hands Bridge at, in Auburn. And the amazing thing about Tim is he's smiling. And the other thing is there's sun on the hillside. And when he crossed the finish line, it's the first time anybody crossed the finish dining line in the Western States in the in the sunshine. He took 21 minutes off the all time horse record. Uh, and then people said it's a fluke, or somebody said, oh, it'll be somebody loaded a horse and went out in the back stretch of the trail. Uh, but he came back in 2013 and he did it again and again. He beat his next year as the second person who was like, in 25 minutes of the uh, And since then, a lot of people now are doing this. Uh, is that just runners? Or but are just two. Um, this is Zach Bitter. He's a high school teacher in Michigan. He set the American track record for running a mile, uh, in, or 100 miles, so 11 hours and 47 minutes. And by the way, he did do a lot of track. Easier for a sergeant. Mike Morton, who's um, uh, Sergeant Major Mike Morton, whose day job is with the U.S. military. Uh, he set the master's course record for the Western States in, in 2013, and he set the American 24-hour distance record of 172 miles. Uh, and again, he did it on, 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 uh, after a couple of years of adaptation to one car. But then this amazing husband and wife team uh, who decided that they want to take a vacation to Hawaii, and to get there, they rode the boat to Hawaii in a competition event where you could not have any support along the way. So, and they set up the, the course record from California to Hawaii to, to Honolulu, the fastest previous crossing of 60 days. They did it in 45 days and six hours. Um, and by the way, um, they're both good friends of mine and he, well, and I should say, but he's my CEO. <laughs> um, uh, and they did this on 70% fat, 20% protein, and 10% fat. Um, so, uh, what's the advantage there? Well, one thing is, remember, if you can recall, fat has nine calories in a gram of fat. Carbohydrate, pure dry, pure sugar, that's what you like, sugar is four calories a gram. They had to have all their food in this boat when they said that. Which means their boat weighed, their, their food burden weighed about half as much as other kind of So it's much lighter. Uh, think, you know, climbing up steep mountains. 
uh, you can carry it a lot, the same number of calories and less pat weight um, when you do that. Um, so I want to be mindful of time. We had a little bit of slowdown here, but I, I do want to talk about my passion, which is reversing type 2 diabetes. So tell me when I'm You've got about 20 minutes to talk and then some questions. I can do it. You can do it. I just thought it was this. It's because you're on a key card. So, <laughs> that is true. I did not need to do Um. So when we're talking about talking about athletes, we're talking about people typically in the carbohydrate tolerant end, <clears throat> and their advantages here are uh, some of the ones I mentioned, and also the fact that their recovery after high intensity workouts or competition is much faster. It appears that the injury, muscle injury and muscle soreness is more, much more rapidly resolved. And we hear this from almost everybody who, who switches from a high carb to a low carb diet. Uh, which means they can increase their volume of training. And the downhill skier, Lindsay Vaughn, we are told, um, switched to the low carb about four years ago. Uh, and for much of her, 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 her uh, career dominating the world cup, she's been low carb. And her, her statement is it's not about losing weight, it's not about um, uh, uh, changing physical properties. It's that I can train twice as hard as, as my competitors and maintain my high intensity training for a longer season. Uh, so again, there are dynamics of recovery and training there that we're getting. At the other end is diseases of insulin resistance, such as type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And um, the reason why one would want to go low carb here is when you're insulin resistant, the more carbohydrates you feed a person, the more trouble their insulin has getting rid of that, that carbohydrate in the food that we have. Uh, so if you get, it just makes sense if you reduce the amount of carbohydrate the person needs, then you reduce the burden that the body has to do to get rid of that. But I'll show you data that says you also reduce or, or reverse the underlying insulin resistance. And that's the attraction of doing this. Um, the first really clear example that we published in this was a study done by Jeff Bullock and a very gifted graduate student at the who is a um, uh, uh, female bodybuilder named Cassandra Forsyth. And they recruited 40 people with what we call metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetes, and is characterized by high triglycerides, a high blood pressure, um, some borderline high or high blood glucose, uh, and low so-called blood cholesterol or HDL, and then characterized also by extra body weight around the middle. And those are the characteristics of metabolic syndrome. Um, but Basically, those are people who have pre-diabetes, so in the increased risk of developing diabetes. And the study involved taking four of these people, and half of them were randomized to eat a calorie-restricted, high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet. So that's here. Uh, it was restricted to 1,500 calories a day. And by the way, if you look at this, say, well, that's not really that high in carbohydrate. Um, but this is only 1,500 calories, and their bodies were burning quite a bit more, probably about 2,500. So this is the intake, not the energy expenditure ratios here. There is the high fat, low carb group. This 12% of 1,500 calories translates out to about 40 grams of carbs per day. So very low carbs here, quite high carbs here. And the difference between the way the diets were administered, these people were told to eat only 1,500 calories a day. But that was to match them up. This is a group of people who were told to eat a low formulated ketogenic diet to satiety. Eat as much as you want to stop the your body. Just keep your carbs low with your body. And when we do that, these people just spontaneously eat 15 hours a day. And so this is what they spontaneously ate. This is the group they matched to that group of polar intake. But it was an outpatient study. It was not in a medical report. So, that when you're lying on them telling us that, that, you know, the truth about what they think, which is always hard for people to do when they do it for three months, okay? So take that with a grain of salt or a gram of fat, whichever. <laughs> um, the other thing I'll point out just briefly is this group reported in eating about 12 grams of saturated fat per day. This group, because of the higher fat intake, ate 36 grams of saturated fat per day. And you got to look at that and say, uh-oh, this is going to drive their saturated fat levels in the blood up. It's going to be dangerous. Uh, this is the weight loss curves for the two groups. And we see this very frequently, that when we, we match people up pretty well and have one group eat like the high carb, one eat low carb, you see greater weight loss in the low carb group. Uh, and yes, it is true that some of this weight loss is water, 
There's going to be loose lighting in your muscles. You lose water along with it. And it's only about one kilo. Whereas the difference here, this is 10 kilograms. This is about five kilograms. So one fifth of the difference here was, was body and body difference. So the rest was body fat. Whether, it's, whether they burned energy faster or whether they were better able to adhere to this diet, but we typically see our superior body fat losses from people who are following a well formulated keto diet. I keep saying, I will say well formulated time and time again, because there are many ways to do a ketogenic diet wrong. Uh, and this is not an easy thing to do in terms of both knowledge base and in terms of what people should eat and then getting them to stick with that to maintain their adaptive state. So this is a complex slide, and I thought I had some color things in here, but I don't. So this shows a whole bunch of differences. The red are the people who are on the high fat, low carb diet. And sometimes we call that Atkins, but it really wasn't Atkins. Uh, but you can see their body fat went down. Abdominal fat, if you measured with this thing called FEXA, they measured the amount of fat in the abdomen, which is the most dangerous fat in the body, was a much greater fat, abdominal fat loss with the, with the High fat, low carb diet. Blood triglycerides didn't go down, they plummeted to a much greater degree. And the so called good cholesterol went up by 13%. And by the way, there's no safe drug that does that. But, uh, and again, people debate does making HDL go up, is that better for you or not? But people who have high HDLs, we know, have a reduced risk of chronic disease. And then the other thing is that when we measured glucose, insulin, and this thing called HOMA is a measure of insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance, you can see the insulin resistance decreases dramatically for people in the low carb diet. So this is not just they're eating less carbs. There's cellular damage that causes, which again, we don't know fully what causes that in type 2 diabetes. It was remarkably improved. And then this last one over here is saturated fat in the blood. Very few people actually measure saturated fat levels in the blood. And we did that. And we know the saturated fat in the blood, the higher it is, the greater the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and mortality. And this is the group here in red that was eating three times as many grams per day of saturated fat, and yet their blood levels went down. Does anybody want to guess how that possibly could be? I mean, it's a paradox, right? Because they're using it as fuel. Because they're using it as fuel. They're using it as fuel, exactly. Control, you get the book. This is after 12 hours of fasting. This is after 12 hours of fasting. But when you double the body's ability to burn fat at both rest and exercise, you basically give them permission to pick what fats they want to burn. We've seen that now in three separate human studies. The keto adaptation basically changes the body's ability to manage fats. And the dangerous ones don't accumulate. And the good lipoproteins do seem to, to get better, uh, including HDL. And I won't get into this, but when you measure LDL, which is a bad cholesterol, but the particle size, the little ones are the most dangerous ones. And the little ones go down dramatically. So across the board, improvements in all the signs of metabolic syndrome, or what we call uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia with a ketogenic diet. My total, total cholesterol doesn't go down typically, and some people's calculated LDL goes up. So this is still very controversial. But just to go right now. That's why I passed the mic. Oh, the, the question was, did we see problems in vitamin deficiencies? Yes. We didn't want to address that question. So what we did is we gave everybody a seven cent per day multivitamin. Because we, you know, they're not killing buffalo out of the great plains. Because the food supply is different. And you know, grass-fed, wild, Food, water, wild caught food, may be very different than stuff you buy and you do over here at the Safeway store. So we just gave them a lot of We didn't want to give them back. Too many areas. Um, so we're not the only ones who've looked at, at people with insulin resistance. And I just want to share one bit of data. There is a uh, physician named Dr. Gunther Bowden at, uh, in Philadelphia at Temple University. and. He did a study where he took 10 people with type 2 diabetes, some of them on insulin and other medications, locked them up in the metabolic research board, had them eat a standard American diet from a buffet for the first week, and they did a bunch of testing, including he measured their blood glucose levels pretty well almost every hour. So this is glucose here. 
This is from 8 in the morning to late in the morning, so across the 24 hour curve. And people with type 2 diabetes, this is glucose in millimolar. Um, <coughs> 6 millimolar is the upper limit of normal uh, in the European terms, 6 millimolar. So you see that before they started on the, on the ketogenic diet, their diabetes were almost one and a half to two times normal. And these are patients on medication being managed their diabetes. And then this shows their insulin levels, so they have very high sugars and very high insulin levels across the 24 hour span. And then they changed the buffet that they gave them, they took away all the carbs and gave them high fat foods and said, eat as much as you want. And they cut their food intake by 1,000 calories a day from about 3,000 to 2,000 calories a day. And in that two week, for two weeks, in that two week period of time, they lost about four pounds of body weight. But these were very heavy people to start with. So it didn't completely resolve their overweight condition. But if you look at their blood sugar levels, they're almost normal here and with much less insulin, which means their body sensitivity to or response to insulin is dramatically improved. And to, prove, they, to do that, they took the gold standard test, which is you actually infuse in the insulin in people, and then you have to put sugar in the other arm to keep their blood sugar from going to driving into coma. And you actually you call the client that if you can measure insulin sensitivity. It's the gold standard for measuring this, this response. And what they demonstrated was a 75% improved insulin sensitivity in two weeks by putting people in the treatment ketosis. So by the way, they took them off most of their meds as well. <coughs> meds were reduced. I'm sorry, but when I translated the slide, to print that small. Uh, <clears throat> but this was basically in two weeks, they made a warm and made a big step towards reversing their diabetes. So then the question is, why do we do this in the real world? I mean, this guy, Gunter Bowden was trained at his fun journey, trained at Harvard, he's one of the world's experts in you know, diabetic, diabetic physiology. He published a couple hundred papers in his lifetime. He did this very late in his career, he published it in a top-notch journal, uh, Adults of Internal Medicine in 2005. And all the nervous probably except for me and some of my friends. And the reason we don't do this in the real world is when this happens this quickly, when you drop the blood sugar from here to here, and the insulin from here to here, you have to take it off that meds. And you do that as an outpatient, you know, and you say, oh, here, try this diet. You know, here's a here's a pamphlet. Here, try this diet. Come back and see me in six weeks. If somebody's on two or three meds for their diabetes, you're going to put their life at risk because you have to change their medicines very quickly. And this is not safe to do in the outpatient world. Because you know, it's, it's an unsafe thing to do. You have to have them in a metabolic research program in a you know, 24 7 monitored clinical care setting. Until that. Until I met this guy who rode across the ocean with his body. By the way, they did that in a boat that had one of those tranquil, closed space, by the way, it's a bathroom going on. I don't know get the details, but uh, it was not, a, not an easy thing to do, and they did it, and they're still there. <laughs> um, anyway, so the science I told you about, you know, we can dramatically change insulin sensitivity, we change the body's physiology in terms of how it burns fuel. Uh, by the way, we make biomarkers of inflammation go to the basement, well, we kind of like 40, 40 or so percent, and there's virtually no drug that safely does that. Um, so the problem then is, how do you translate this into a cost-effective outpatient setting? And so what Sami Ingen had convinced me was that we can do this through virtual, uh, remote, uh, continuous care. So we'll just take a, a, the patient, we'll hook them up to the doctor, we'll hook them up to the coach, uh, and we'll have them uh, basically monitored and tracked and supported 24-7. Uh, and so this is the, this crazy endeavor that I got looped into at this phase of my life, and it's fun. Scary, but fun. So you basically take a patient with type 2 diabetes, you give them a glucometer, which also measures ketones. Uh, by the way, we use the Abbott um, precision extra, but we're also testing the Mojo, Keto Mojo. Yeah, both my question less expensive. Yeah. Uh, so we measure the blood ketones, not your ketones, because your ketones are very inaccurate. Uh, they measure their weight daily on a cell phone connected scale. They stand on the scale, downloads into the app. 
We track the glucose, we track the ketones. They talk to their coach, the coach is connected to the physician, the physician is connected to the patient. Um, and so we basically bring continuous care into the outpatient setting. And we can do it pretty much anywhere where people have um, cell phone connectivity uh, and to do this. And it'll work on pretty much any smartphone. And you say, well, how, how often do people interact? So we, we, we decided we're going to do this. Then we said, we've got to prove that it works and it's safe. So we, and I'll show you, we've set up and are running a study in Indiana. Um, and in the Indiana study, uh, for the people in the remote continuous care arm, their number of interactions through, with the coach through the app is 3.1 times per day. There is no way that an outpatient physician can do this from his or her office. Um, now, this is a completely different way of, of doing clinical care. Uh, but the necessity is that this is outpatient intensive care. Um, and this is absolutely necessary to be able to do this safely. So if you, if you say, well, Steve Finney told you, you know, you, you know, people with diabetes, you know, high medications can kind of go on the side and get a whole lot better only when you have the person connected to an expert system and continuous support. We also provide them with most of their education and what to do and why to do it. They get to sometimes see little, little versions of me talking on a small screen. They have a patient support community, uh, so peer support and peer teaching as part of the process. But sometimes they'd rather hear about it from other patients than from you know, old guys like me. Uh, and so I said, you mentioned we, we uh, are running a, a demonstration study in Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, so this is 12 people, by the way, they've all signed releases, so you know, we're allowed to use their photographs. Uh, but they, we started out with 262 people with type 2 diabetes, average age was 54. They were as a group were very heavy, BMI of 41, for some of the, the very, uh, very obese range, for average. Um, they were 67% female, and uh, not as wide a racial mix as we would like, but uh, we did cross multiple racial, racial groups with this, in this 262 people. We published data earlier this year in two different uh, papers, one on the diabetes change and one on the blood lipids and cardiovascular risk changes. I just put that up there. And I presume that people have access to the slides later if you want to go and check out and, and yes. see if the paper really says what I said it said. Um, the first thing is, can, can people actually follow this kind of diet? Can you get real people in the real world? By the way, we didn't do this in Palo Alto. You know, we did it. <laughs> It was recently a study published in, in JAMA, and I looked at it, and the average education, the study of Stanford, the average patient education was uh, uh, college plus three years. <laughs> um, anyway. So we had a large thing down to this group of people uh, in this study, uh, and at the end of the year, we had 83% of them re retained in the, the protocol, uh, which is very good retention for. Uh, a, a study of this nature. Uh, next question is, so did, what about ketones? You know? uh, and they were measuring their ketones and reporting them through the app, so it wasn't just once or twice during the study. Um, and again, people with diabetes, because they're insulin resistant, have, have a hard time getting into nutritional ketosis because the body's more resistant to this. Nonetheless, you can see that the mean value at the start was above 0.6, whereas I said initially 0.5 is kind of what we arbitrarily call the threshold. And they maintain that out eight months. And even at the end of the one year, their values are still two to three times what the baseline 0.1 values would be. So, for whatever reason, whether it's the smiling faces talking to them on their cell phone or whatever, but they found it feasible to stick with this diet for the most part uh, for the duration of that. Uh, these are the classes of, of seven different types of medications used for, for people with diabetes. And the most dangerous two are insulin and this other group called sulfonylureas. And the reason these are dangerous is when you give people insulin, well, the sulfonylureas actually make the body make more insulin. When you drive up insulin, it goes up too high, and you have the risk of hypoglycemia, which can be life threatening. So our goal was initially, as their diabetes improved, was to get them off these two classes of of drugs, and then there's a, there's a reason for people want to get them off this class here. Uh, by the way, these two here are very expensive. The Somali rays are cheap. Um, uh, and then you see out here that these two classes, we didn't make much change, but this one here called metformin is not only a diabetes medication, but it's a diabetes prevention medication. And even though 
Um, we couldn't take the people off it. They were still at risk of you know, going back to diabetes, so we left them out. But the point here is that 54% of their medications, 54% of their medications uh, were, were removed. This is what happened to hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of their average blood glucose. And 6.5 is the threshold for diabetes. And you can see that we got a response very early and we retained that spot response for a year. Um, and technically, if you looked at just the completers, 60% of them are out of diabetes for each year. We looked at, at not completely only people, but the people who no longer stayed the protocol, we still had 57% of them basically reverse their diabetes at one year. This is not a good result. This doesn't happen in standard clinical care. You can do this with obesity surgery. But this is the first time that people have demonstrated this degree of retention. And that was their weight loss. And again, like that other study I mentioned, they ate just Italian from day one. They didn't even count it as a test. And the weight loss is about 12%. Uh, these were a couple other studies recently published uh, showing that with, with, low, with ketogenic diets at the start, and again, they get weight loss like we do, but after six months, they're gaining weight back. And ours, and I can't tell you, we now have the one year data, and I can't tell you where it is either. But we're very proud of, of our people now being at two years. By the way, this is a five-year study. We're not going to just say, oh, it's not good you're going to do it. We're really sitting with you. Because like this athletes, they're going to teach us a lot. Not just from the people who are successful, but for the ones who aren't. They teach us how to do it better. Uh, I'm going to kind of zip past. This is cholesterol changes. This is all the other heart risk changes. I'll just point out that these two things down here are inflammation biomarkers. This was our control group. And these changes here in this direction show a dramatic reduction in inflammation. And we now understand inflammation to be an underlying factor in diabetes, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's. I mean, this, we're getting at a root cause of disease here, which has fascinating implications. We have not proven that we're going to affect these other diseases, but it's a crucial area for further research. Um, the pros on this are obvious, the cons are. With the rapid production of medications, the people who are on medications for diabetes and hypertension, you have to have real time medical monitoring. People should not be trying this on their own and going back to see their doctor a month later or two months later. And we think we can do that safely with this. By the way, we had no attributable, this is technical speaking, we had no attributable serious adverse events in the one year of 262 people on our study. Um, which means we think we have evidence that's very safe. Now, all my conclusions are obvious, but I want to get to my last slides. Oh, those are the, all the people who did the study, uh, and I'll point out that uh, you can climb mountains on this too. Uh, this was uh, my first of four Sundays on Mount Shasta on the Love Park Diet. And it's great because the pack goes along with us. Thank you. to get back. So it's going to be individualized and it appears to be, to some degree, a 
publishing of this, of underlying this and this. Some of them uh, 
uh, will only eat watermelon uh, at, the, at the stops. Uh, typically, they, they don't eat that much fat. They, don't, they, they just use strategic carbs and they're running on, on basically what they have stored. Uh, uh, and, uh, but there's one runner I know who eats 100 calories of skittles in a <laughs> this is really like sugar. There's one in the back here. She's been Hi. Okay. The results of your diabetes study are phenomenal. So, do you have any hope that this model will be adopted as a standard of care for diabetes? I mean, we presented some of this data at the American Diabetes Association meeting two weeks ago, and our uh, uh, the, the our employee who was three years out of her PhD was um, voted one of the, 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 the top young investigators for the presentation. At the American Diabetes Association, I mean, two years ago, it never would have happened. So never say never, but it's a hard start. Uh, what we're focusing on right now to develop a little bit of our business is the people who feel the most pain are self-insured employers. Because an employee with a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes costs their that their care five to seven thousand dollars more per year. So if we can reverse the case of type 2 diabetes, we can save that much money. Uh, and that's that's you know that's where we're going as a business right now. So um, I actually did the keto diet, I weighed about 200 pounds, I was able to lose seven and a half percent of my body fat. My primary objective was to lose weight um, and I achieved that. One of the things I did have a challenge with, I probably did that in six or seven weeks, I did find it hard to exercise. And I don't know, I just didn't continue on the diet long enough. Um, so I think ultimately my question is, for the average person that's just an average athlete, if you lose your weight, what are the key benefits of staying on the keto diet as opposed to moving to a less aggressive, maybe Atkins type Mediterranean diet? Excellent question, and there are a number of answers. Um, for most people who go on a ketogenic diet, when they measure their ketones, they're actually not a ketogenic diet. They're close. But they're 90% of the way there. But they didn't get there. So measuring ketones, objectively measuring ketones, at least till you know what works for you. You know, I only measure my now if I change something. I haven't done this for 14 years. Um, but initially, measuring ketones is very important to, to, to actually make sure you arrive in that space of nutritional ketosis. The second, the most common error is that people want to eat a healthy diet, so they're eating all the same for fat, but you know, we all know salt bad for you, so they don't eat much salt. And nutritional ketosis accelerates kidney salt excretion. And if you don't, if you eat a low salt, low ketogenic diet, you will feel nausea all the time. You'll have headache. Fatigue, stand up, you're dizzy, exercise at 10, 15 minutes in exercise, you just feel like somebody pulled your plug out of the wall and you gotta stop. And that's volume depletion because you need salt for blood circulation. So I mentioned that the Messiah drank blood. They lived in the middle of the Great Earth Valley, they didn't have salt lines. Where'd they get their sodium? Because you know, they, they sweat and they use salt. And the best they get is from blood. 140 milligrams of sodium per liter of blood. What they did was they, when the Inuit killed the, the caribou in there, they saved the blood. The Maasai would use a little lancet to poke the neck vein, collect the blood, they come and put a little plaster over it to stop the bleeding and, and how we go on raising it. It was basically going around finding salt for it. Uh, and so it was actually a, a, a necessary, sodium is a necessary nutrient for well being. We're all told we should eat less than three grams a day. Um, and that's been around for about 30 years, and it turns out that's being completely debunked now by carefully done objective research, not presumptions, despite the size and self of research. We find is that unless somebody has high blood pressure or congestive blood pressure, they should eat five grams of sodium. Not five grams of salt, five grams of sodium for that. And so we just have people take salt to first, food to taste, which is typically about three grams for average person, and then take two commercial bland food for that if they're not willing to make their own money problem. Although the homemade ones are best. So, but again, that's why we have a coach and we have a whole bunch of, there are a whole bunch of pitfalls that people can fall into. This is not an easy thing to do. And we all don't just automatically know. Those things went through. And that phone I knew more about how to do a ketogenic diet than I would have. 
because they had 18,000, I'm sorry, 1,800 years of experience with them. So, but I noticed that you keep in both uh, comparisons of uh, high carb or low carb, the protein and the meal. It was important because one of the things when the acting, uh, act, proper acting diet said that if you eat too much protein, you kill your kidneys. Is anything what you put your protein at the limit and focus on more fat? Or? Yeah, we, yeah. The question is, is protein intake? Yeah. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, one of the many errors that Dr. Atkins made was the um, one of the many errors he made was he called it a high protein diet, and it's, okay. it's not a high protein diet; it's a moderate protein diet. And people can get by on 10 to 15 percent of their daily energy expenditure, not intake, the expenditure as protein intake. And the reason I have expenditure is because if I'm eating 1,500 calories a day, I'm burning 3,000. But so the plate is different than what my what's on my body is metabolic. So we just have to keep that in perspective. So, but moderate protein in the 262 people we follow now for two years, we see no evidence of dead kidney death. In fact, renal function improves slightly, but statistically, which is gratifying because it gets rid of again one of those myths that it's a high protein diet and I'm totally kidding. Thank you so much. I know there are more